Welcome to the 20th lecture in the series, Introduction to New Testament Textual Criticism. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to be sympathetic to your people. In whatever circumstances we're in, remind us of our connection to one another. Remind us of how your son was afflicted in the affliction of your people. Help us to do what we can to help one another knowing that it's, it's not when we, when we think about one another's burdens, but when we bear them, that we fulfill the law of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we are investigating a textual variant in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. In the vast majority of manuscripts, verses 43 and 44 of Luke report that as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and that as Jesus was in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. But in Papyrus 75 and Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Washingtoni Washingtonianus, Codex N, and a small assortment of later manuscripts, these two verses are not in the text. The critical texts are not in agreement about Luke 22, 43 through 44. The text of the first edition of the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament did not include this passage. It is in the fourth edition, although it is framed by double brackets, which the, the introduction states enclose passages regarded as later editions. Bruce Metzger stated in his textual commentary that Luke 22, 43 through 44 is a later addition to the text. Now the manuscript list that I have given is very summarized. At the end of this lecture, I will mention some online resources that have more detailed information. The testimony of the manuscripts is usually straightforward, but in some cases there are important details that are not conveyed by simple lists. For instance, consider manuscript 0171. This small fragment is assigned to the late 200s or early 300s. It was not mentioned in the textual apparatus for Luke 22, 43 through 44 in, in, in some editions of the UBS Greek New Testament or in the first edition of the Tyndale House Greek New Testament. 0171 very clearly displays the final words of verse 44 supporting the inclusion of the contested passage. Next consider Papyrus 69. In this fragment from the 200s, verses 43 and 44 are absent, but so is verse 42. This is probably the result of accidental line skipping from a point near the end of verse 41 to a similar point near the beginning of verse 45. This probably indicates that P69's exemplar did not have verses 43 and 44, but that is a guess. The testimony of Papyrus 69 is tenuous. Third, there is an interesting feature in Codex Alexandrinus. Although Codex A does not have Luke 22, 43 through 44 in its text, it includes section number 283 in the margin near the beginning of verse 45. So the text of Codex A supports the non-inclusion of verses 43 and 44, while the Eusebian section numbers in the margin of Codex A support the inclusion of verses 43 and 44. Also in Codex N, there is no Eusebian section number 283. And also in Codex Sinaiticus, verses 43 and 44 are in the text as initially written, but somebody subsequently placed curved marks around each line of the passage. Then someone else attempted to erase those curved marks. And in Codex Delta, verses 43 and 44 are included in the text, but someone has added a column of four asterisks in the left column alongside the four lines that are mostly filled by these two verses. We will consider some other quirks in some other manuscripts, but first let's turn to the patristic evidence, which includes some evidence earlier than the earliest manuscripts of Luke 22. Justin Martyr, who was martyred in the 160s, used this text in his composition Dialogue with Trypho, chapter 103. Commenting on Psalm 22, verse 14, he wrote, in the memoirs which I say were drawn up by his apostles and those who followed, those who followed them, it is recorded that his sweat fell down like drops of blood while he was praying. Now, reckoning that the Gospel of Luke was not written before the early 60s, 
This implies that Justin's copy of the Gospel of Luke was separated from the autograph of the Gospel of Luke by less than a century. Also two decades after Justin, Irenaeus wrote the third book of his composition Against Heresies, when Eleutherius was bishop of Rome. In the 22nd chapter, Irenaeus used Luke 22:44, mentioning that if Jesus had taken nothing of Mary, that is, if he had not experienced physical human nature, he would not have eaten food harvested from the earth. He would not have become hungry or weary, nor would he have sweated great drops of blood. Irenaeus's contemporary Tatian included Luke 22, 43 through 44 in his Diatessaron around the year 172. Around the year 360, as Ephraim Cyrus composed his di commentary on the Diatessaron, he also mentioned the detail about Jesus' sweat becoming like drops of blood. Also in Ephraim's Carmina Nisabina in Hume 35, part 18, Ephraim pictured the devil saying this about Jesus. While he was praying, I saw him and was glad, because he changed color and was afraid. His sweat was as drops of blood, because he felt that his day had come. In the early 200s, the writer Hippolytus referred to Luke 22:44 near the beginning of chapter 18 of Against Noetus. In the course of giving examples of the contrast between Jesus' divinity and his humanity, Hippolytus wrote that in agony he sweats blood and is strengthened by an angel. The first patristic writer to mention manuscripts that don't support Luke 22:43-44 is Hilary of Poitiers. Around the year 350, in Book 10 of his Latin composition De Trinitate, in Part 41, Hilary wrote, We cannot overlook that in very many Greek and Latin codices, nothing is recorded about the angels coming and the sweat like blood. Despite acknowledging such manuscripts, Hilary does not offer a judge judgment on whether, whether the passage has been omitted in the copies where it is absent or interpolated in the copies in which it is found. He seems to have been less concerned about reaching a correct verdict on the textual question and more concerned about promoting correct theology. He said that heretics should not be encouraged by the idea that Jesus' weakness is confirmed by the need for an angel to strengthen him, and that his sweat should not be construed as a sign of weakness. And like Irenaeus, he points out that the bloody sweat demonstrated the reality of Jesus' physical body. Hilary seems content to use the text, affirming that we are forced to the conclusion that all this happened on our account. In 374, Epiphanius of Salamis made some very interesting statements about Luke 22, 43-44. In Panarion 19.4, he quoted these verses as an example of passages that Arians used to show that Jesus sometimes needed assistance from others, or that he was inferior to the Father. And it says in the Gospel according to Luke, there appeared an angel of the Lord strengthening him when he was in agony, and he sweat, and his sweat was as it were drops of blood when he went out to pray before his betrayal. Now it should be noticed that Epiphanius quoted verse 43 with the reading, Angel of the Lord. In Panarion 61, Epiphanius used the passage again in the same way. He used the passage for doctrinal purposes and stated that without the display of agony and sweat pouring forth from Jesus' body, the Manichaeans and the Marcionites might seem reasonable in their theory that Christ was an apparition and not completely real. He emphasized how Jesus' sweat like blood showed that his flesh was real and not an apparition. Epiphanius claims in Panarion that Arius cited this very passage from the Gospel of Luke in an attempt to demonstrate the subordination of the Son to the Father. Now so far, so far we could read Epiphanius' remarks and think that the only form of the text that he knew included verses 43 and 44. But, in Anchoratus, chapter 31, Epiphanius wrote that the passage is found in the Gospel according to Luke in unrevised copies. He also mentioned that Irenaeus had used this passage. Then he said, the Orthodox have removed the passage, frightened and not thinking about its significance. Now, coming from someone who seemed ready to blame heretics for bad weather, this is a remarkable statement. 
Epiphanius uses Luke 22, 43 through 44 again in Ancharatus chapter 37 as evidence that Jesus was truly human and that his sweat shows that he was physical. Around the year 405 in Asia Minor, Macarius Magnes in the third part of the work Apocriticus quoted from a pagan writer, probably Hierocles, a student of Porphyry. Hierocles lived in the late 200s and early 300s. When this pagan writer objected to Jesus' statement, Do not fear those who kill the body, he wrote that Jesus himself, being in agony, prayed that his sufferings should pass from him. But the term being in agony is probably a recollection of Luke 22:43, because this term is used there, but not in the parallel passages. For the testimony of Amphilochius of Iconium, who lived from about 340 to 400, we rely on a collection of extracts in the medieval manuscript Athos Vatopedi 507 from the 1100s. A note simply says, of Amphilochius, Bishop of Iconium, on the Gospel of Luke. It states there, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Regarding Didymus the Blind, there is some reason to wonder whether it was him or somebody else who wrote the, wrote the work called De Trinitate that is attributed to him, since some interpretations of the author are different than interpretations expressed by Didymus in some other works. Theologians do sometimes change their views, but whoever wrote De Trinitate, he made an accurate quotation of Luke 22, 43 in Book 3, Part 21. Ambrose of Milan in the late 300s, in his commentary on Luke, seems to use a text that did not contain verses 43 and 44. He does not mention the appearance of an angel. He does not mention that, that Jesus' sweat became like drops of blood. John Chrysostom was a, a patristic writer who used Luke 22, 43 through 44. Once he did so in a comment on Psalm 109, and once he did so in the course of his 83rd homily on the Gospel of Matthew, which covers the parallel material in Matthew 26, 36 through 38. In homily 83 on Matthew, Chrysostom does not say that he's put down the text of Matthew and now has turned to the text of Luke. But after referring to Jesus' prediction of Peter's denials and Peter's insistence that he will never deny Jesus, Chrysostom transitions to the contents of Luke 22, 43 stating, And he prays with earnestness, in order that the thing might not, might not seem to be acting, and sweat flows over him for the same cause again, even that the heretics might not say this, that his agony was a pretense. Therefore there is a sweat like blood, and an angel appears strengthening him, and a thousand sure signs of fear. Now after in interpreting this for several more sentences, Chrysostom returns to the text of Matthew 26:40. We will reconsider the significance of this after we've seen the testimony of the cluster of manuscripts known as Family 13. For now, let's go on to the next patristic reference. The testimony of John Cassian should not be overlooked, even though his name does not appear in the textual apparatus for Luke 22, 43-44, and the UBS Greek New Testament are the Nestle Island compilation. John Cassian traveled widely to the Holy Land, to Egypt, and to Rome before residing in what is now France in about 415. In his first conference of Abbot Isaac on prayer, also known as the Ninth Conference, in chapter 25, Cassian states that the Lord, in an agony of prayer, even shed forth drops of blood. A statement by Jerome in Against the Pelagians, Book 2, Part 16, shows that Jerome was aware of some copies that had Luke 22, 43-44, and some copies that did not. In 383, he included the passage in the Vulgate. Later, in Against the Pelagians, he wrote that these words, the words we know as Luke 22, 43-44, are, in some copies, Greek as well as Latin, written by Luke which implies that Jerome also knew of copies in which the verses were not included. Theodore of Mopsuestia, a contemporary of Jerome, who worked mainly in Syria and Cilicia, also had Luke 22, 43 through 44 in his Gospels text. In 1882, the researcher H.B. Sweet, uh, S.W.E.T.E., published a collection of some fragments from Theodore's works, and one of them includes a full quotation of Luke 22, 43 through 44. 
Only slightly later comes Theodoret of Cyrus, who famously oversaw the withdrawal of 200 copies of the Diatessaron in his churches. In 453, Theodoret wrote Hereticarum Fabularum Compendium, and in this work, after presenting Jesus' statement in John 12, 27, he says that Luke taught more clearly how Jesus was indeed suffering when he was in agony, and he proceeds to use part of verse 44. Now we come to the testimony of Cyril of Alexandria. Now, Cyril of Alexandria died in the year 444. In Cyril of Alexandria's Sermon 146 and Sermon 147 on the Gospel of Luke, Cyril describes the events in Gethsemane in Luke 22, but he does not mention the appearance of an angel, and he does not mention Jesus being in agony or as shedding drops of sweat like blood. He states, Everywhere we find Jesus, we find Jesus praying alone. In those places you may also learn that we ought to talk with God overall with a quiet mind and a heart calm and free from all disturbance. Now that's not the sort of thing one says when one is reading a text that says that Jesus is praying in agony and sweating huge drops of blood. Cyril says in Sermon 147, Let no man of understanding say that he offered these supplications as being in, in need of strength or help from another, for he is himself the Father's almighty strength and power. Cyril doesn't come right out and say explicitly that he rejects the idea that an angel appeared and strengthened Jesus, but he comes very close to saying so. Severus of Antioch, in the first half of the 500s, supplies some additional information about the text used by Cyril in an extract from the third letter of the sixth book that he wrote to the glorious Caesarea. Severus stated the following, Regarding the passage about the sweat and the drops of blood, Know that in the divine and evangelical scriptures that are at Alexandria, it is not written. Wherefore also the Holy Cyril, in the twelfth book written by him on behalf of Christianity, against the impious demon worshiper Julian, plainly stated the following. But since he said that the, 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 the over, but since he said that the divine Luke inserted among his own words the statement that an angel stood and strengthened Jesus, and his sweat dripped like blood drops or blood. Let him learn from us that we have found nothing of this kind inserted in Luke's work, unless perhaps an interpolation has been made from outside which is not genuine. The books, therefore, that are among us contain nothing whatever of this kind, and so I consider it madness for us to say anything to him about these things. And it is a superfluous thing to oppose him regarding things that are not stated at all, and we shall be very justly condemned to be laughed at. Then Severus states, in the books, therefore, that are at Antioch, and in other countries, it is written. And some of the fathers mention it. He names Gregory the theologian, and John Chrysostom, as two examples. Then he says that he himself used this text in his 64th homily. In this way, Severus drew his readers' attention to Emperor Julian's use of the passage in the mid-300s, and to Cyril of Alexandria's rejection of the passage in the early 400s, and to the acceptance of the passage in Antioch, and by Gregory of Nazianzus, by John Chrysostom, and by Severus himself. Severus's testimony is particularly significant because he specifies that the copies in Alexandria lacked the passage. Later, in the 600s, a writer named Athanasius the Abbot of Sinai is credited with yet another text-critically relevant statement about Luke 22, 43-44. Amy Donaldson, in her 2009 dissertation, explicit references to New Testament variant readings among Greek and Latin church fathers, included his statement. It says, Be aware that some attempted to delete the drops of blood, the sweat of Christ, from the Gospel of Luke, and were not able. For those copies that lack the section are disproved by many and various Gospels that have it. For in all the Gospels of the nations it remains, and in most of the Greek. There's also a marginal note preserved in Ministerial 34 that states that the report about the sweat drops is not in some copies, but Dionysius the Areopagite, Gennadius of Constantinople, Epiphanius of Cyprus, and other holy fathers testify to it being in the text. Now we could examine Moore's patristic support for Luke 22, 43-44 from Augustine and Nestorius, but let's go back to the evidence from Chrysostom. 
Why, in homily 83 on Matthew, does he take a detour to comment on Luke 23, 20, 22, 43 through 44? It can't be absolutely ruled out that he just wanted to cover a parallel passage. But another possibility is that by the time John Chrysostom wrote homily 83 on Matthew, it was already customary that when the lector read the gospel reading for the Thursday of Holy Week, after reading Matthew 26, 39, he also read Luke 22, 43 through 44. John's brief detour into Luke 22 interlocks very snugly with this custom. In addition, in Codex C, a secondary hand has written the text of Luke 22, 43 through 44 in the margin near Matthew 26, 39. This brings us to the evidence from the cluster of manuscripts known as Family 13. In most members of Family 13, Luke 22, 43 through 44 appears in Luke, either in the text or margin after Luke 22, 42. Most of the members of Family 13 also have these two verses embedded in the text of Matthew after 26, 39. The evidence from Minuscule 1689, a member of Family 13, is very helpful. This manuscript was lost for several years, but has been found safe and sound in the city of Prague. It has Luke 22, 43 through 44 in the text of Luke, and alongside Matthew 26, 39, there's a margin note instructing the lector to jump to section 283 in the Gospel of Luke, that is, to jump to Luke 22, 43 through 44. Many other manuscripts have similar notes in the margin at this point, as part of the lectionary apparatus. It does not require a long leap to deduce what has happened in Family 13. Instead of resorting exclusively to margin notes to instruct the lector to jump from Matthew 26, 39, to Luke 22, 43 through 44, and then return to Matthew 26, 40, somebody whose work influenced members of Family 13 simplified things for the lector by combining the parts of the lection in order within the text of Matthew. Some commentaries have misrepresented this as if it implies that the passage is not genuine, but the evidence in Family 13 just shows that the passage, a passage that was regarded as part of the text of Luke, was embedded into the text of Matthew after 2639 for liturgical purposes. On a related point, when Luke 22, 43 through 44 is accompanied by one or more asterisks, such as in Ministerial 1216, the default deduction should not be that the purpose of the asterisk was to express scribal doubt, but to serve as part of the lectionary apparatus, drawing attention to the two verses that were to be read after Matthew 26, 39 in the lection for Maundy Thursday. So, So, was Luke 22, 43 through 44 initially present or initially absent? The passage is supported by a broad array of manuscripts, plus the manuscripts of over 20 patristic writers and a couple of non Christian writers. Four patristic writers, Hilary, Epiphanius, Jerome, and Athanasius of Sinai, show that they were aware that verses 43 through 44 were not supported in all copies, but nevertheless they favored the inclusion of the verses. Epiphanius even said that Orthodox individuals had attempted to remove this passage. One Latin writer, Ambrose of Milan, did not have verses 43 and 44 in his text of Luke 22. And one Greek writer, Silo of Alexandria from the 400s, definitely did not have verses 43 through 44 in his text. The most ancient evidence from Justin, Tatian, and Irenaeus includes this passage. The most geographically diverse support points in the same direction, and support for these verses does not come from only authors with one doctrinal view. Plus, internally, nothing in the surrounding material calls for the insertion of something more. Uh, Bart Ehrman has proposed that verses 43 through 44 don't look like something that Luke would write, on the grounds that Luke had an interest in portraying Jesus as imperturbable. However, Luke reports about several actions of Jesus in which his disposition is far from historical or disinterested, including his criticism of the synagogue ruler in chapter 13 and his weeping over the city of Jerusalem in chapter 19. There is really no substantial case based on internal evidence for the idea that verses 43 through 44 could not originate with Luke. 
When we look at the external evidence that supports Luke 22, 43 through 44, the question should not be, did somebody remove these verses from the text of Luke, but why did somebody remove these verses from the text of Luke? It is virtually unique to see a Christian writer assert that the Orthodox tampered with the Gospel's text, and to imply that some Orthodox believers revised the text in a way that was influenced by their fear. The absence from verse of verses 43 and 44 in Papyrus 75 implies that the removal happened relatively early in the text transmission. In the 100s, the second century writer Celsus, in a statement preserved by Origen, claimed that some believers altered the original text of the Gospel three or four or several times over, and they changed its character to enable them to deny difficulties in the face of criticism. Now, there's no way to tell if Celsus saw what he says he saw, but it can't be ruled out that he did indeed notice Christians making changes to the Gospel's text, and that because some of those changes appeared to him to relieve perceived difficulties in the text, he naturally believed that this was the motivation for those changes. However, he might have seen and misunderstood something else. Textual adjustments that were not made to minimize interpretive difficulties but to render the text easier to use when it was read in church services. One of those adjustments may have involved a liturgical feature pointed out by John Bergen in the Revision Revised. Here I slightly paraphrase his observations. In every known Greek Gospels lectionary, verses 43 through 44 of Luke 22, Follow Matthew 26, 39 in the reading for Maundy Thursday. In the same lectionaries, these verses are omitted from the reading for the Tuesday after Sexagesima, the Tuesday of the cheese eaters, as those in the East call that day, when Luke 22, 39 through 23, 1 is, used to be read. Furthermore, in all ancient copies of the Gospels which have been accommodated to ecclesiastical use, the reader of Luke 22 is invariably directed by a marginal note to skip over these two verses and to proceed from verse 42 to verse 45. What is more obvious, therefore, than that the removal of verses 43 and 44 from their proper place is explained as a side effect of a election cycle of the early church? Now, many manuscripts have been discovered since the time of Bergen, but in general, what he describes is accurate. Luke 22, 43 through 44 is embedded after Matthew 26, 39 in the lection for Monday Thursday and it is left out of the lection assigned to the Tuesday after Sexagesima Sunday. The customary transfer of Luke 22, 43 through 44 into the text of Matthew, when the text was read during Easter week, may explain the sudden detour that Chrysostom took in this passage in the course of his homily 83. A scenario that explains the most evidence in the fewest steps is that when an attempt was made to revise the text for liturgical reading, one group of liturgical revisers took verses 43 and 44 out of Luke 22, but failed to reinsert them into Matthew 26. As soon as these verses dropped out of the text, the shorter reading was defended along the same lines that we see Cyril of Alexandria used to defend it. We don't have hard evidence of this particular liturgical step being undertaken in the second century, but the elegance of Bergen's explanation is a strong factor in its favor. Plus, this theory accounts for the correspondence between this particular feature in the Easter time lections and the very similar contrast between forms of the text with and without the passage. So, I conclude that Luke 22, 43 through 44 was an original part of the Gospel of Luke. I also conclude that its removal in the second century was probably not the result of some copyist's desire to get rid of what he considered a problematic passage nor was it the result of a heretic's desire to remove a text that demonstrated the physicality of Jesus' body. Instead, it occurred when Orthodox believers transferred verses 43 and 44 into Matthew, after 2639, conforming to their Easter time custom, but failed to retain it in Luke, again reflecting the early Easter time liturgy. As a result, these two verses fell out of the text. This influenced text known to Hilary, to Ambrose, and especially Cyril of Alexandria. It affected the text that was translated into Sahidic, and the Greek text that was translated into Armenian, and the Armenian text that was translated into Georgian. But as Athanasius the abbot of Sinai stated, although some had attempted to delete the drops of blood from the Gospel of Luke, 
The legitimacy of the passage is shown by the many and various Gospels manuscripts in which the passage is read. Luke 22, 43-44 should therefore be respected and cherished for what it is, part of the Word of God. For additional information, see the excellent and very detailed article Luke 22, 43-44, An Anti-Docetic Interpolation or an Apologetic Omission by Lincoln H. Blumel, which can be found online as part of Volume 19 of the TG, TC Journal for 2014 at jbtc.org. A detailed analysis of the evidence can be accessed as part of the volume for the Gospel of Luke in Whelan Wilker's online textual commentary on the Greek Gospels. A convenient presentation of some of the data about patristic statements regarding this passage is included in Amy Donaldson's two-volume 2009 dissertation, Explicit References to New Testament Variant Readings Among Greek and Latin Church Fathers. Links to each part are online at https colon slash slash c-u-r-a-t-e dot nd dot edu slash show slash 5712 m 615 k 50 Also, the English translation of the Panarion of Epiphanius of Salamis, books 2 and 3, by Frank Williams, was particularly helpful in preparing this lecture. Thank you.